accounts. <coughs> I had the idea for this rather randomly. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but one of the most fascinating aspects of that summer of 1940, apart from uh, the Battle of Britain, Dunkirk, uh, Britain being alone, so to speak, is essentially what Britain was prepared to do in the event of a German invasion. Now, like I said right, on the previous video, there's many conflicting things about Operation Sea Line or the prospective German invasion. There's many plans, you know, where they were going to set up shop for the Einsatzgruppen, who were they going to put in charge, and uh, they were restless, which included people that had died before 1940, like uh, Sigmund Freud. They even had people like Noel Carrad on the list. Uh, one of his friends phoned him when it was made public in the 50s, I think, and said, darling, look at the people we'd be seen dead with. So was it serious or not? Well, either way, under Churchill's instinct, or at least somebody's instinct, in May 1940, the genesis of what became known as the British Resistance started to take shape. No one knew for sure, of course, whether the Germans were going to come. The assumption was, especially after Dunkirk, that they weren't going to be hesitating to come over. Now, assuming the Germans had the capability to actually invade the country in July, June, July 1940, it would have possibly gone in their favour in the Senate, on land at any rate. The British Army had mostly had left most of their equipment behind in France. Uh, fighter command was decimated, or at least they had which severe reduced numbers. I mean, of something like, I think, it's 400 odd aircraft uh, fighter command sent over between September 1939 and May 1940. Only something like 40 odd uh, or 60 odd came back. It was in my dissertation. <laughs> it's If you want to check out the exact figure, it was in um, Patrick Bishop's Fighter Boys. And the Royal Navy were there. The Royal Navy would probably sort the inflation flat. And this is the thing, you know, the Germans had no material to actually launch a cross-channel invasion. Um, you know, they were confer, as you famously seen, they were confer in uh, river barges. Now, these barges would have moved at an incredibly slow rate of speed, carrying tanks and horses and everything. And the German Navy would have to be right up against it to prepare to defend them. But the German Navy had suffered grievous losses in Norway. They lost quite a few ships that they had no business losing, really. But they didn't know what they were doing, I suppose, the German Navy. Ships like the Bismarck and the Tirpitz weren't yet ready. Certainly the Bismarck wasn't. I mean, I think they only just launched it that year, so it wasn't in any shape. And essentially they reckon that a bow wave of a passing ship would sink the bloody barges. So, you know, but either way... Britain was preparing. I have a chap called Colin Gubbins, who had been helping out the White Russians during the Russian Civil War, who had been in Ireland uh, during the Troubles, or at least in the 20s, uh, was tasked with organising some sort of resistance network in the event of a German invasion. And that's what makes the British resistance that much more interesting. They were the only resistance network created in Europe before invasion everyone else like the Norwegians the Danish the French the Belgians the Dutch etc all had their assistance networks pop up after invasion because I guess none of them really expected it to happen certainly not Norway and Denmark they were never really top of Hitler's public list so to speak so Colin Gubbins was working with military intelligence brackets R end brackets for research and along the way they created these units called auxiliary units now, they were officially part of the Home Guard, and they were split up between England, Scotland, Wales, and they were known as uh, 200, 201, 202, and so on. And um, I have to check that figure. Me and figures don't always uh, make sense, uh, well, in, in my head. But they were created nonetheless. If anyone was looking through paperwork about where money was going, they'd look at, say, 202 home guard, a uh, unit, home guard or whatever, and I go, oh, okay, it's a home guard. And on paper, these chaps that were taking part were home guard. Now, some of them were, but many of them were civilians, and that's another interesting factor, because whereas, of course, home guard were civilians, but like older men that had been in the First World War, or young lads that were too young to apply just yet for arms, uh, the armed forces, uh, the auxiliary units would go into a village or whatever and they'd choose you know the far the local farmer would be involved the local 
Bobby the barrister maybe you know it would be like country figures if you look at say um, well, yeah, if you say look at Dan's army, it'll be the equivalent of going into, t you know, assume there's no home guard, it'll be the equivalent of saying to um, Captain Manor, and look, do you want to join? You know, we've got a job for you. He gets recruited. Um, you know, Sponge gets recruited, and that's it. Yeah, the rest of them are left alone, possibly. Now, it worked a lot more complicated than that. There was a house in, out at Swindon Ray that they all had to go to for interviews. It's the same lady that met them. She was a postmistress, and they did their training, if they could, in this house. At the same time, the Royal Engineers were building what was known as um, operating bases, OBs, and these operating bases were very small bunkers, effectively, dug wherever these auxiliary units were going to be based. Woodland, farmland, uh, under church, in church crypts possibly, some of them, you know, wherever they could. And they'd be, say, no bigger than my, uh, my room here. And you had no more than half a dozen men to a unit or a cell. And they would have in that room, you know, rifles, machine guns, grenades, explosives, whatever. And as I say, they were created before a German invasion. And after the war was over, you know, they went, most of these chaps went back to their day jobs. Some of them even went back to their day jobs before the war was ended. The auxiliary units were uh, effectively disbanded by 1944, briefly reactivated during D-Day, especially on the Isle of Wight, because they were expecting Germany, for some reason, to go for the Isle of Wight. Even if Ger hit, 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 June 1944, the Germans had nothing capable of that, I would have thought, but it's a nice prospect, isn't it? How that, that would have been bloody, that would have been messy, would have been pointless for the Germans, I would have thought. Uh, Hitler already had the Channel Islands. I mean, Hitler facing Portsmouth. <laughs> Portsmouth alone would kick his backside into check. But in all seriousness, let's say Fire Command have been worn down, say the Royal Navy has been battered somehow, and the Germans have landed on the coast, say between uh, Dover and my mind's going deal or some such. Either way, they were sure, and they're now starting to spread out. Their aim is for London. So, the Germans are landing on the beaches. The auxiliary units hear the signal or whatever. The bells, church bells are ringing, which obviously were silent until the Battle of El Alamein to signal victory, but this isn't a victory. So the auxiliary units, just without really much word to their loved ones or whatever, and that's the thing, these like, they, they would so hush-hush, you know, a chap's wife had no idea what he was doing. Probably thought he was having an affair because he was disappearing in the middle of the night or something. So they go underground, so to speak, into their OBs, and they wait. And there would have been a connected series of unit uh, women, like in the uh, RAFs or uh, RENs or whatever, there would be that little radio stations, said stations, and they'll be going, tank, so many tanks landing, Y gate, so many tanks coming up, Canterbury or whatever. And the idea is, is that the Germans would have swept over, and the chaps would come up, and how how he and harass and sabotage and just do anything to make life nasty for the Germans. And they reckon that the auxiliary units would have had a life expectancy of no more than six, seven days, if caught, and they would have probably been caught if they were having that such a short life span. Um, they would have been shot out of hand as uh, saboteurs, terrorists, frank tours, if I got my pronunciation right. Um, some of them would probably actually have to assassinate people in their village. It sounds ghastly, but they reckon, some of them, that if he wasn't already part of the uh, AUs, he would, uh, the local Bobby, would be uh, assassinated because he could liably, he would be in a position to help the Germans, even if he didn't want to. I mean, you only have to look at Jersey Guernsey, you know, the famous picture of a copper to talking to a German officer. Then, you know, the Germans would turn up in, say, Stoke Paddington, what name? I could have chosen better. And the local, the only Bobby in town in the village turns up, and the Germans go, right, we want to know where we can, you know, we want to set up a base of operations, we want someone to put our tanks or whatever, uh, we want billets. So he'll, he might go down the local pub, the manor house, blah, blah, blah. 
whether he wanted to or not, he'd be helping them out. And then gradually, under occupation, he probably would have been helping them out. It's hard to say. Who's to say this is a trouble with this kind of thing? What ifs? So they would shoot him and then continue. And as I say, these men had day jobs. So the fact that they would never see their loved ones again, probably. And then, you know, Germany gets to London. Churchill goes down in a sea of blood because he wasn't going to leave. The Wall family have fled to Canada, uh, British Parliament on their way to Iceland, possibly, and then on to Canada. Um, the Wall Navy are trying to get out of it as well, you know, save as much as they can to carry the fight on overseas, and German Britain surrenders. And then who knows what happens. Presumably, there would have become, like you saw on the continent, in real life, a, gra a, a much more dedicated resistance network. And that is not to say the auxiliary units, right? but the whole idea of the auxiliary units in a way was to be expendable. Harry, harass, blow the hell out of things, and then that's it. If they succeeded, they succeeded. But like I say, they weren't expected to survive, really, once the invasion started. Certainly not in, in the invasion zone itself, say Kent. That is not to say that the resistance plan was solely down to these men, and there were some women involved, but they weren't necessarily saboteurs, they would be communications officers and the like. You can go to some places still and see pillboxes and anti invasion uh, crocodile teeth, you know, to stop tanks coming up, and various other little things that you wouldn't necessarily notice unless they were pointed out to you. Uh, Dan Cruikshank did a three part program about invasion. Uh, to, of England over the millennia or so and in the third episode he focused mostly on the German threat in 1940 and there's some manor house, I can't remember where it is, I haven't got the episode to hand anymore because it was on cassette but in front of this manor house was like you had the main gates and then you had this kind of arrow, you know, two sections of brick wall that looked harmless enough like, you know, they're kind of like a windbreak kind of thing, but they had gun slits so the idea was, as I presume the auxiliary units or whatever, came out and peppered the Germans as they came up the road and he went into some woodland with this tiny little stream and there's tiny little you know, brick walls that are not there for any other reason but to be used by would-be defenders and the uh, operating bases started to be found from the 60s onwards because essentially the war, the invasion threat receded the war engineers, whoever went around either blowing some of them up because you know they had arms in them or just simply filling them in and leaving them and people have been falling into them and all the rest of it and there's still probably dozens we don't know and that's the thing, the locations of them are pretty fake I don't think anyone, it seemed, put them down Gubbins, at the end of 1940, went off and joined the Special Operations Executive, and indeed most of the part, uh, auxiliary units went into the SOE, such as the actor Anthony Krell. Anthony Krell was in the auxiliary units up north around the Fumberland array, and then he was in SOE Greece, Albania, where he never talked about the experiences in the SOE, because it shook him. So that's a kind of, you know... but. There's a pillbox on the end of, I always get my Putney's middle, uh, middle, middle door, I think it's East Putney, uh, heading, heading southbound towards Wimbledon, and it looks like a signal box, and I think, in, in fact, tier, at London Transport, and now TFL, have used it for things. Uh, when I've been on holiday in Weymouth, I went out of my way to find a pillbox wrapped round the Fleet Lagoon, just off Chesil Beach, oh, uh, as you walk out to Portland, and... When I've been, the, the tide catches it up, and at low tide you can get to it. You can't get into it from what I remember, and also I wasn't keen to in case I got caught at low, uh, changing the tides. Um, I don't know why they put one there, because you look on the map, maybe it's to stop them, yeah, just harass the Germans if they were coming down Chesil Beach to Portland, because you know, the naval base was still at Portland during the war. And the Fleet Lagoon up towards Abbotsbury is where the Dambusters bouncing bomb was tested. So, you know, maybe there was other stuff that they were putting pillboxes in for. And I get there's many, if you look on Google Earth, there are what looks like other pillboxes. And there's some websites with lists of where you can find pillboxes. And I tried to get out there one day, but there wasn't a safe way to walk. And I, my trainers was getting bogged down in the mud. And I, 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 you know, I don't like water the best of times. And I certainly don't want to be stuck in the mud. 
for the sake of a pillbox. Some used to be on cliff tops and like and uh, subsidence over the decades they've fallen off the cliff. Um, Abbotsbury still has crocodile teeth up from the Fleet Lagoon. Uh, there's crocodile teeth elsewhere. Uh, Dover Castle still has things I'd imagine. Uh, when I was there you got the dynamo room. Dover Castle would have been the primary target once the Germans were ashore in Dover, that and the docks anyway. So Britain was prepared for it. You know, everyone said at the time that made it out of the war that had Germany came ashore they would have gone down fighting. It's intriguing to think, isn't it? On the Channel Islands, just like anywhere else in occupied Europe, people cooperated with the enemy, slept with the enemy, uh, snitched on the enemy for the enemy. That's not to say everyone on the Channel Islands did, but I'm just saying that you don't know what would have happened had Britain succumbed. And as I said in a yesterday's video, if Britain went under in the summer of 1940, that is it probably. We would have. Europe would have been forever dominated by Nazi Germany, at least for decades. Um, Germany might well have been able to finish off Russia in 1941. The original invasion date was May 1941, but uh, Britain went into Greece, which was largely to make the Germans come down, and the Germans ended up having to you know, spend a month kicking us out of Greece. And then Germany invaded in June, and stopped in the suburbs of Moscow when the winter kicked in. That extra month would have made all the difference. It's possible Russia would have gone under, at least Moscow would have gone under in 1941, and when the four settled, Germany would have been able to power on south uh, to the uh, Caucasus oil fields. All of that is subjective, you don't know. But the auxiliary units, as I say, gradually faded away. They weren't needed, and no one knew about them for years. There have been a few books that have touched upon it, but it's only been in the past 10 years that they've more and more come to the fore. I mean, when I was doing my dissertation in 2008, there wasn't much material published to base anything from. There's a book called The Last Ditch, which was written in the late 60s. I mean, it would be interesting to know how that chap did it. He's dead now, unfortunately, so I can't ask him. But I, uh, the cabinet, there's a lot of declassified papers I was looking at, and fascinating to read because they were preparing for it. It's incredible. And, they, you know, at one point, the Harfist stopped the auxiliary units in October 1940 from actually practising. So, I mean, you know, it's a half arsed thing in places from the sounds of it. Some of the more famous people involved was Andrew Fawn, who commanded units out in Norfolk Way, and uh, Peter Fleming, travel writer, who's nowadays known as Ian Fleming's older brother. And Peter Fleming was a key part of the auxiliary units. September 7th, 1940, uh, the work, code word Cromwell was flashed out, which um, everyone assumes today meant invasion was coming. It meant invasion is probable or some such, or invasion is imminent. Auxiliary, or home guard and auxiliary units alike took to ground. Roadblocks were put up, church bells were ringing, and then it turned out it was a false alarm. It coincided with a heavy armada of German aircraft, which it turns out were on their way to bomb the blazers out of London the first day of the Blitz. And up north in Scotland, the auxiliary units are taken to ground as well. You know, I mean, Germany could have tried a diversionary thrust up there. And next thing you know, um, they wouldn't come out. <laughs> they weren't believing any of the code words. They were like, well, you could be a German saying that. We're going to stay here until, you know, the last bullet. And it took the local commander, the Scottish auxiliary unit commander, Eustace Maxwell, to go out there and say, chaps, it's all the false alarm, could you come out please, thanks awfully. And even then they refused to budge for like a few hours and then they came out. So it's um, it's quite really, uh, brilliant, yeah, that little story. But they never were used, thank God. And it makes you wonder, don't know, if they were. If they had managed to do their bit and then the army drove the Germans into the channel or the Germans surrendered. Would we have met the maiden heroes, I wonder? They were very top secret for years after the war ended. Um, and, you know, a failed German invasion in summer 1940 would have weakened Hitler militarily. He might not have gone into Russia in 41, or if he did, it wouldn't have been with the full forces he had. Um, German Navy would have been ruined in an invasion attempt. 
what's hearsay. But one of my uh, what's that that helped me get interested in it? A book I picked out random from a second-hand bookshop written in 1990 called "And All the King's Men" by Gordon Stevens, and I eyelid it, and it said "Britain under the Third Reich" as it does, and then it says. Um, you know, Hitler's invasion of Britain is brutal, brutal, and it starts off in 1939. You see the opposite chaps, this chap recruited for the auxiliary units and his mates. The invasion happens, they do their bit, invasion succeeds, Britain surrenders, and then it changes into a proper assistance network like you got in France, etc. And then the Americans come and liberate it in 1942. So, it's a, they're about... You won't find any statues to him because the invasion never happened. You won't f hear any songs being sung of him, any movies made of him. And indeed, the only other book I can think of, there might be others, is Owen Shears' book Resistance, set in a 1944 where Germany has somehow managed to invade Britain after D Day fails. Historically inaccurate. <laughs> but it's a good little book. Read that one. That's more easy to this one, you know, I, I can't find anywhere, but it's not in bookshops. Uh, as, I, as I said, I got mine from second hand book market uh, or shop, so yeah. So that's your auxiliary units um, 80 years ago this month, this week, probably created.